took nature hundreds of millions of years to evolve a bacterium and billions of years to make a grasshopper. I, I alone am the one who's responsible for what's happened. So let me ask, when did you first feel that, that everyone is accountable for their actions? Well, thanks to you for, for sending uh, that uh, creation science uh, material. Because I always, I always believe the, uh, the lie that uh, evolution is truth, the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from uh, the slime and uh, when, we, when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. So it, the whole theory cheapens life and uh, started reading books about how, that show how evolution is, is just a complete lie. There's, there's, no, there's no basis in science to, uh, to uphold it. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. All right. Hello, family. Thank you guys for joining. Blessed to have you here. It has been about a month since we went live, and it's just been driving me crazy. I've been wanting to hang out with you guys, but I've had a lot going on. But here lately, evolution, the deception of evolution has really been making me angry. As most of you know, I am a teacher, and I teach biology most of the time, and evolution is a part of this standard. It's a part of every high school, every public school standard and they make it very lengthy with the common goal of uh, making you repeat the words common ancestor. So we're going to be looking at that today. This video is about looking at, well, first, the complexity of life, the evidence for evolution. There's a lot of it, so we're going to have to go through it. And that's what the standards want you to do. If you're an educator out there, because I get told all the time, you know, how can you be in that system and believe what you do and be a creationist, you're going to be judged. This is an evil belief. And so um, I'm going to talk about that and how we should cover this topic. It is one that is leading so many astray, so I'm extremely passionate about it. It took me a while to get my presentation to upload, so that's why it took a few minutes uh, to start this. But thank you so much for joining in. Those of you who received the notification and have clicked the bell, if you're somebody watching this after the fact, make sure you click the bell continuously. Go in, make sure it's still clicked, because I hear a lot of people say, for whatever reason, not that they're trying to hide anything we're showing, but the um, notification bell or the sub subscription uh, gets removed. So be vigilant with that, and that will help us out a lot so we can stay connected. And be sure to look in the uh, links below to uh, follow us where our work is saved. We have a lot of it or everything is uploaded to Odyssey, and so you can find it there. I've, I don't go live there or anything, but this is the first time I've ever streamed live from Facebook as well, so I have both going on. Never done that before, but I feel like it's better to branch out so we can reach more people. We have um, about a little over 50,000 followers there and a little over 100,000 here, and it seems like a lot, but with the shadow ban, especially on YouTube, YouTube's actually become worse than Facebook. We get more views on uh, Facebook than we do here. We got over a million views, or almost over a million views on a video the other day, or the other week, the one about the UFOs, and uh, it's crazy. You can do that on, on Facebook still, surprisingly, and so um, I don't think they're as good at flagging truth as YouTube is. YouTube has sort of mastered it, and so um, blessed to see it spreading, no matter which platform it is, while we're here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, add to the stream, our presentation. 
And this is this is the picture that I use when I'm going over this with my students. And I tell them it's okay to ask questions and it's definitely okay to question the answers you were given because we were given a lot of answers about the proofs of evolution. And for me personally, it was extremely easy to buy into because it's just like with the globe, you're seeing a lot of animations where there's gaps, where things can't be proven. They create animations and they use tons of them. So always question the answers. And that's what we're going to be doing here. And it actually makes kids excited about this topic when they see the new information. We're kind of stuck in the past. That's the one thing I don't like about um, the way things are done is that we we don't throw out evidence when it's been proven fraudulent. We don't throw out evidence when it's obviously updated and the information we have now is newer. And it's just because I think, especially with us old school teachers, we've seen things when we were in school and we like to just regurgitate it, repeat it. And the things that I've taught in the past that were false, um, I'm not here to condemn anyone who's teaching this, who's taught this stuff in the past. It's just that now, once you know the truth, don't have any part in it. I don't care if it's for your job safety or security or whatever. A verse comes to my mind that is extremely um, visual, one that I see when I think about this topic. And it's spoken directly from the Messiah when he says, And whoever may cause to stumble one of those little ones who are believing in me, it is better for him that a weighty millstone may be hanged upon his neck and he may be sunk in the depth of the sea. Okay, that's not saying that's your punishment. It's saying it'd be better for that to have happened than you to actually go through with what you're doing. That'd be a better end for you. Okay, so these little children, they're precious. And as a teacher, I feel like, okay, I could I can control the environment of the hundred or so kids that I have. And that was that was good for me. I kind of felt good about that. But last spring... Um, I had, I was in a meeting and we're talking about evolution and I'm trying to stay quiet. I'm trying to stay peaceful and, and, and not lose my job. But as I'm sitting there, I can hear the father, you know, tell me their children matter to me too. You know, like these children are all precious to him, not just the ones in my classroom, but every single one. So we, we really need to uh, unite on this. If you're a parent at your school board meetings, you know, bring evidence with you. Don't just say we need to have faith in the Bible. You know, show them where things have been proven fraud and it's going to get dark. You're going to see some of the darker sides of evolution as we go along. And a lot of it is based on racism. And I'm not here race baiting. It literally is. You can you can look at the work and um, and I can show you exactly how it is. There's no let me just kind of make something racist. It really it really is. And uh, it dates back to, you know, the days of uh, Nazi Germany, the super race ideologies going around. And a lot of them came from evolution. And so evolutionists from an evo that standpoint, they would see something like this and teach this as evidence of an adaptation. And if you can't tell, I don't know if you're looking at this from a phone screen or a computer screen, that is not a leaf. It may look like a leaf if I was sweeping or raking my yard, I would think that's a leaf, but that is a butterfly that was designed, not blindly evolving to look more artistically like a leaf than anything you and I could create. This is a extremely intelligently designed bug that was designed this way so that it would have protection so that it would survive in the environment. This beautiful butterfly who wasn't always a butterfly, their, their DNA is so unique that it can grow one type of organism and then stop that and grow into a different organism with a totally different purpose. It's not going around and eating the leaves anymore. It's pollinating flowers. It's, do, it's just a beautiful creation. So the intelligent design aspect, that's what draws me to biology. And I think we, we really darken and ruin biology when we stop being fascinated by that complexity. When we start looking at it as just, okay, this is a random creature here you know, from an explosion of stars that, you know, are now stardust that made everything a rock in a vacuum covered with water somehow. And then billions and billions of years later, you've got something like this. And so that's the, somebody said no sound. Is there, I saw in a comment, is that true? Do a sound check. 
Somebody said, I heard no sound. Is there, is there any sound, guys? Can somebody verify that I have sound before I keep talking? I haven't been reading the chat like I normally do because there's a lot to cover. Um, hoping there is because it would be awful to go through 30 minutes. Somebody said I have sounds. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vader, Vader Bear and Plain Stevie. Um, so uh, back on track, we were um, looking at the complexity of life and just understanding that that's what's going to make kids passionate about um, biology and in general. And it sort of just darkens things when we give them these cartoons like this one here. And ironically, they've named it the tree of life. And typically when you see them in the classroom, it's the ones on the left side of your screen that only show a few organisms. And then the one on the right actually shows quite a bit more and they try to make them all go back from this tree that they are calling the tree of life. They're mimicking what the father makes, making it their own. So of course that's what they're going to call it. But they will not show you a tree of life that has every organism and there's a reason because you couldn't fit just the birds that the father created onto one page and the butterflies you couldn't fit everything onto one page you would have to use an entire state or i mean like literally billions not to sound like carl sagan but billions <laughs> of organisms out there and so if you made a family tree with all of them, it would look ridiculous because the amount of times, even if this is, this is what I had to go through to give you a little backstory. When I was investigating evolution thoroughly as a creationist, after I had some miracles happen in my life that proved to me there's a creator, of course, I'm asking deeper questions. I'm not just mixing the Bible with the worldview anymore. I'm going back and looking at evolution. And so this was the first little uh, avenue I went down and explored before I found out the truth about the world that we live on. And so I'm in my classroom with a marker board, drawing out the timelines. When did the first life allegedly appear? I'm using their timelines to see if it measures up. And you find out that they say that there's been almost 5 billion species identified, ex both extinct and living. And life originated way less than 5 billion years ago. So you're having already one new species every year from that time that doesn't count the mass extinction when everything was wiped out. So if you go from there with the known species that we have, the chances dwindle down even more of producing the amount of diversity we have and not just diversity, complexity, symbiotic relationships, all of it. And so this is something that a lot of people would need to see, but we can't make posters that show the real tree of life, if it was to be to scale with all of the organisms, it would be massive. That's a massive undertaking. I don't think you can do it in your lifetime, given that there are billions of species that have ever been known to exist. And so that takes us also to the age of the earth, because we use that billions of years and millions of years all the time. But you see weird stuff that should change the way we view it. Because when I was in school, I was taught that fossilization took a long time. And so if you saw a fossil, it was already ancient, you know, thousands, if not millions and millions of years old. But we see stuff like this surface and it just kind of gets swept under the rug. People start talking about time travelers. We found a fossilized cowboy boot, uh, boot in Texas, or not boot, a, co a fossilized cowboy foot and uh, in Texas back in 1980. And this shoe looks like it's from the modern times, like the 60s, 70s. It's not that old, and so this shows us uh, that fossilization happens quick and that somewhere there was a one-legged cowboy for a while hoping he survived. I don't know what happened. We're, nobody investigated, I'm assuming, to solve that, that because uh, they thought he was a time traveler, I'm sure, when they found that in the 80s. And so uh, you see uh, things like that, and also this hammer here. He used to go around, people would share this thing on Facebook and be like, who created it? Was it ancient aliens or civilizations, you know, that made this hammer that looks just like something somebody from the 1800s or early 1900s would make? And it's in a rock that they would say is about 140 million years old. So that would be impossible. And uh, that's that's sort of where you start seeing the timeline come into question. And people wonder why we question it. It's because we know that this fossilization process happens pretty quickly. 
and some of the evidence you're about to see um, in terms of the alleged dinosaur bones. I know there's a lot of people out there who look at the dinosaur bones versus uh, dinosaurs being a hoax quite differently. And I'm kind of I'm at a, I'm at a place where I feel like those bones, the reason we don't have a complete set is because of what we read about, like in the book of Enoch with the clash of the giants or clash of the titans, uh, they call it with modern mythology, but where the, the Nephilim had to battle it out. Of course, there's going to be a lot of wreckage, and then you combine that with a flood that followed. Things are going to be spread out far and wide. You're going to find giant femurs over here and a giant bone over there. And so they start making things um, out, of, out of what they find, the little fragments. They complete those full full models. So we're not going to go into those details about the dinosaur hoax and all of that. But you also see more proof that fossilization doesn't take very long. Here's a good example. We've got a an octopus that's fossilized. And if you guys have ever seen or held an octopus, they're, they're so slimy and squishy because they don't have any bones. They can fit through very small openings. And so uh, that's one thing that shows you it doesn't take long because that soft tissue would have dissolved and been gone if it took thousands of years to make this fossil. And uh, scientists back then when they found this were like, man, that's quite the chance that something like this would have lasted. That's kind of like finding a fossilized sneeze or something is what they said. And so it's, it's not something that would be impossible if the world were as young as they say it is and there was a massive flood. And so you have a lot of soil moving and covering this creature up. And there you go. This fossil here is a pre-flood octopus, most likely, or something that just got covered up in some sort of mudslide underwater. So definitely proving the narrative that we were given, or at least I was given in school, is false. And you see things like this servicing this creation creationist on Facebook post stuff like this, where you see these 25, allegedly 25 million year old frogs that were supposed to turn into humans, but somehow they stayed exactly the same over all those years, did not evolve, not one bit, not one bit. But the um, definition of evolution is just change over time. That's something that is not controversial. We do change over time. Things change over time. Technology, people, and it's always outside factors affecting that. You know, and you have, you know, they say, oh, people are a lot taller than they were 50 years ago because we're injecting them with hormones. We're doing all these different things to alter life, but that's not us just changing into a new creature, into a new kind. We're still people. And that's one thing that that is extremely important when you hear that word evolution. That's all it means. And so cars evolve over time as well. But evolution itself is not, I repeat, it's not a creator. And all of the scientists out there who believe in evolution, they say, you know, the origins of life is unknown, really. And so we can just talk about it and say, yes, it appeared somehow, this first cell. But they don't know how evolution can create life because it can't. You can take a cell, rip it open, let everything spill out and try to put it back. It will not come back to life. Once you kill it, it's dead. OK, so the Frankenstein narrative definitely not happening. And the thing about millions of years and time, that only makes life break down. If you did have the things that made a cell out there in nature, if it didn't miraculously find DNA, the, the cell membrane and wrap around it, it's going to decay with time. So time's actually going to hurt it. OK, so. There you go. And this is another one I show my kids. We can modify life existing life, but no scientist ever has created life. You'll see articles like that, newspapers or, um, you know, little links that pop up. People are sharing that are like, look, scientists just created the first cell and it's doing all these different things. And then you read further and it's like, oh, no, they took a bacteria cell and they modified it. So creating life, we cannot do. The breath of life is required. And so I want to show you that I've done I've done videos on that before where we look at the uh, breath of life and I want you to see that I'm, I'm about to show you a, a video of cell division, real time, real cell division or not real time. It's a time lapse, but it's cell division happening. It's not an animation. It's one of those things that looks like an animation when you see it, but it's not. 
it is they used a special die. So I kind of want to break this down before you see it and you're not really confused. It is a they use what's called SIR tubulin or SIR tubulin, however you want to pronounce it. And it's it makes the microfibers in the cell, those little spindle fibers light up. And so I was always told that the nucleus is the brain of the cell. But when you see these things work, they essentially they look like two hands grabbing the chromosomes. So the red stuff that you see that you're going to see is the uh, chromosome and the uh, the chromosomes in the middle of the nucleus. They're going to start getting gathered and packed together by the spindle fibers. And when they get them matched, kind of like your mating socks, they're going to pull them apart. OK, this force is being guided by something. Remember, these cell parts, they don't have eyeballs. They don't have brains, yet they are miraculously guided with pinpoint accuracy on a beyond microscopic level to stick to kind of like Spider-Man. That's the analogy I give to my kids. Spider-Man, if he was on each end of the cell shooting out a bunch of webs, that's a lot. That's what this looks like. And it doesn't just shoot out and stick to them and pull them apart like our drawings. It actually moves them around like two hands and separates them so that your cells are making exact copies of themselves. So I'm going to show you that real quick and see if it plays and uh, let you guys enjoy that. And then we'll talk about it because this is my favorite footage um, of cell division of all time right here. Let's see, there it is. So right there, chromosomes lining up in the middle and getting pulled apart. This is sped up. It looks like the breath of life as we know it. Pulling these cells apart. Really cool. I'm going to rewind that again just a second. Bam. There you go. This looks like a magic show, like that that animated magic when they're doing when they're doing those little uh animations of something taking place and magic's involved. This is how growth and repair takes place. It's called mitosis. <clears throat> yeah, someone said, what if we were seeing a computer generated microscopic images? That's what I would think, but they're using special lights, kind of like a fluorescent light, and it makes things glow. That special dye uh, adheres to those cell parts and the lighting is what makes them glow. So it does look extremely animated. And when you slow it down, it's really cool. Those spindle fibers, again, it looks like two white hands, almost like when you're just ripping apart something like a, like an apple or something, just ripping it apart. Again, these are, these are cell parts, little beyond, you know, just microscopic cell parts moving and they're doing so with this force guiding them that is so accurate. You've got millions and billions of cells and this is happening in them. And that this is something that's happening all the time. So that's why when you cut yourself, you're able to heal. Your cells are making copies of themselves and they know when to do it, how to do it. If you were to go and donate blood, okay, your body, it doesn't undergo that exact process because your, your uh, blood cells don't have a nucleus. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. I want to pull that slide up. Let me see if I can find it, because that to me is really cool as well. Hold on a second. Where is it? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Um, right here. Okay. So looking at cell division, I got to thinking about this this year is how do we make more blood cells? If I go and donate blood, let's say I lose all that blood, my body's going to know that it's been lost and it's going to replenish that blood. Right. And so where does that blood come from? If they don't have a nucleus and they don't divide like other cells do, where do they come from? Well, you look into it and we're told they come from your bone marrow, that your blood literally comes from your bones. So looking at a skeleton, I would not think that, hey, that's where our blood comes from. But there's this bone marrow in there and these little small tubes and veins and arteries that go in there. And so that's why, you know, breaking a bone hurts. There's nerves in there as well. And so your blood forms in the bone. And so allegedly there's this hormone released miraculously when you give blood and uh, you feel like you're about to pass out. I don't know if you've ever done that. When I gave blood, I almost passed out. Um, but my body replenished that. Okay. 
And so um, once that happens, your body starts making that blood coming from your bones. Okay, remember that. And uh, it releases enough until you, until it's reached the right amount, which is cool to me because it's like a blind process. This hormone's like, okay, you've reached enough. How do, how do hormones know these things? How do they know, okay, they've reached the certain amount of gallons or whatever, you know? How do they know? And it's because it's extremely complex and intelligently designed to do what it does. And it does so without us even thinking about it. I don't have to think, hey, let me regrow the blood that I lost. It happens miraculously. And one thing that's cool about that, if you've ever had a child or gone to the ultrasound, when these things are the size of an apple seed at about five weeks, they already have a pulse. Before they even have a skeleton, they've got a pulse. Think about that. To me, <laughs> this stuff just keeps me up at night thinking about how complex and cool creation is, how, how wonderfully you guys are made. And we try to make this, and not we, but they try to make this seem so random and insignificant, but it is beyond what we could ever imagine it being. And life in the overall, the symbiotic relationships, when you look at what makes our oxygen versus what we use to take in that oxygen, they almost look like replicas. Your lungs and the tubes in there branch out just like a tree. And that was because we have a common creator not a common ancestor. My lungs aren't related to that tree. My lungs were designed by the same powerful creator that made that tree and knew that the creations he was making were going to need it. They were going to need it to grow their food, to make their oxygen. All of these things were considered and factored in by a brain and a mind of a creator that goes far beyond what our minds could think of. Could you imagine if we tried to make a self-sustaining ecosystem on our own with living things. We can't even make living things, okay? And so we had the breath of life put into us, and that is why we see that complexity, that program, like we've been programmed. You know, a lot of people say they see computer code, and if they were to find that somewhere, they would say, okay, obviously some computer programmer made this code, but when they find genetic code, they're like, okay, that code just randomly appeared together to make what we have now. And the all of the symbiotic relationships are just by chance. And yet we find out with environmental science, if you remove certain species, it destroys everything. You can take out ants and it would ruin everything. You take out wolves from uh, Yellowstone. They had wolves taken out and it killed the forest. Why did it kill the forest? Because there was nothing to keep the deers under control. And they started eating up all the vegetation and the trees couldn't grow. So everything is balanced. And we've learned that when you remove the diversity that our father made, it does damage. And so we're always having to go in and they try to play God and add wildlife here and try to fix things by adding, you know, wild animals here that they took out and, and always doing damage control because we're horrible at maintaining what he has made and designed to uh, function perfectly. And uh, here's, here's a cool, cool imagery here. It's kind of sad. They had to Somebody donated their body to science, I hope. But this is from the human bodies exhibit where they lay out your nervous system and your blood vessels, all your blood vessels in the body, or as many as they can delicately uh, not destroy. And you see, we're just intertwined with these different systems and all this, I mean, like miraculous walking machines we are, and we take it for granted. And uh, anytime there's a, a corruption that happens or some sort of error, we blame God. Oh, there's, you know, this creator didn't do, do this right. Otherwise, I would have perfect vision when in reality, the downfalls that we have were created by mankind or caused by mankind, by pollution, by all the different things we do to uh, corrupt all flesh. There's a good example of the mechanisms of a hand. And I'm always, always fascinated how these things just... Mankind couldn't make that. When we try to make robotic hands, they're, they're nowhere near as awesome as a regular hand, even to this day. And here is, here's, here's a big one. This right here, this will blow your mind. DNA. When we talk about DNA, we always picture the double helix as if we've seen it. But the uh, truth is, we've never seen the double helix. Not one time have we, have we had a clear photo of the double helix and the clearest one people always send me, they go, yeah, we do. Here it is. That's not a double helix. That I could tell you that was a human hair. 
and you would believe it. There is no double helix seen, and to me, it's it's a lot like the um, heliocentric model. We have to have animations to see it. The complexity of your design is so small that we have to have animations to see it. And it just dawned on me one day while I'm teaching this stuff. I'm like, all I use is animations. Why? Why don't I get real DNA photos and look at it? You can't. We don't have anything beyond this. As at least that's what I'm told. I'm sure there's stuff out there that um, with the fallen technology and all the things they're doing with these, these uh, shots or jabs they're giving everybody. I'm sure they know what they're doing because they say that even though we can't see it, they're going to let us put something in our bodies that can modify this to cause you to make certain things. And that's where you get back into the cell division aspect is what blew me away is none of the science teachers were talking about it is if you alter that one cell and it's making copies like we saw earlier, that's not a good thing because cells make exact copies. You're going to have more cells doing what that one cell was doing, if that makes sense. So definitely don't want to alter that. And if you're somebody who is watching this and you already have uh, done that and you've taken the, the shot, the father is greater. He can he can heal you and restore his own back to normal. Things we do in foolishness, he's very willing to forgive us. All right. And here here's the uh, here's something somebody shared with me. And they said this is the highest definition photo of a cell. And I thought, man, how did they get this photo? Well, they they make it a lot like they they make their space photos with data. And they say this is the closest replica of, of what it looks like inside of a cell. And so it's random confetti. It looks like to me, it looks like somebody just threw some confetti out there and a lot of different like toys, almost like you're looking into a toy box here, but all these different things. And this is what scientists are showing us that cells are supposed to look like with all their little parts. And there's harmony inside there. You imagine all these things, the DNA, the proteins, everything, the mitochondria, all this stuff. It's not just random. It's actually performing functions on a level that's beyond any factory we have. And that's just one cell. And again, this is all about intelligent design. This is not a, I mean, I know this picture is not real. It's not a real photo. If we could see the real thing, it would probably blow this out of the water. Okay. Now, now we're going to start talking about the, uh, <laughs> the dinosaur issue. And I'm going to show you some stuff that is really cool. And that changes again, the timeline of these dinosaurs but when I was looking up and trying to find complete skeletons of these dinosaurs, what I was finding and, and what was blowing my mind is that we never have a complete skeleton. When you, when you go out there and go to those exhibits, I remember being a kid and going to those science museums and seeing these dinosaurs and just being in just all of these creatures and thinking about how many millions of years ago they roamed the earth. And of course, you know, I watched Jurassic Park, you know, one, two and three and uh, Jurassic Park was one of my favorite movies because they would show that stuff to us in school. It was the one time where they're like, guys, this is awesome. We're going to show this movie. And I remember just being so happy. They wheel in that little TV, uh, not like they have the projectors of today. We had the little glass front TVs, the little small TVs on the carts. And uh, we were just captivated by this stuff. But they don't have a complete set. They may People claim they do. And I've tried finding pictures of them. I can't find a full photo or a photo of a full dinosaur skeleton anywhere. And so you guys can help me out. If you find one, send it to me. I'd like to investigate it. But this brings me to the work of a guy that I found back when I was doing my evolution investigation years ago named Mark Armitage. And he is an awesome man who was working in as a, in the micro or, uh, at the university of California. I'm going to read the article because this guy got fired for his discovery. Why did he get fired for his discovery? Because it destroys their narrative. This is him right here. His YouTube channel is Mark H Armitage. Check out his work, share this stuff. You know, I try to share this stuff with coworkers. They don't usually look at it. I had one look at it the other day and was going, how is this possible? And I'm over there like going, yes, I hope they keep digging because they're obsessed with dinosaur fossils. If they can get obsessed with it and look at this work, they could actually join this guy. He lets people explore and use these bone specimens that he finds instead of locking them up like the other people do. He lets people look at them. He lets people break them down. And what he does at his institute is he dissolves the bone specimens that he finds, these alleged ancient dinosaur bones. He dissolves them and he finds soft tissue all the time. 
on every continent he's been able to do this. And so I'm going to read this article for those of you who probably can't see it on your phones. It says, um, attorneys for a California State University Northridge scientist who was terminated from his job after discovering soft tissue on a Triceratops fossil have, has filed a lawsuit against the university. It, I don't think it tells you in this article, because this is an older article um, from back in 2014. He won the lawsuit. They fired him. And they shouldn't have done so because he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just sharing his work. But it goes on to say, while at Hell Creek Formation Excavation Site in Montana, researcher Mark Armitage discovered what he believed to be the largest Triceratops horn ever unearthed at the site, according to attorney Brad Dacus of Pacific Justice Institute. Upon examination of the horn under a high-powered microscope back at CSUN, Dacus says Armitage was fascinated to find soft tissue on the sample, a discovery that Bacus said stunned members of the school's biology department and even some students because it indicates that the dinosaurs roamed the earth only thousands of years in the past rather than going extinct 60 million years ago. And since some creationists like Armitage believe that the triceratop bones are only 4,000 years old at most, Armitage's work uh, vindicated his view that these dinosaurs roamed the planet relatively recently. According to the complaint filed July 22nd in Los Angeles Superior Court, the lawsuit against the CSUN Board of Trustees cites discrimination for perceived religious views. Armitage's findings were eventually published in, the, in July 2013 in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. Imagine that. And according to court documents, shortly after the original soft tissue discovery, a CSUN official told Armitage, we are not going to tolerate your religion. Then, never mind their religion. We're not going to tolerate your religion in this department. And so they are being discriminant towards him based on his religion or what he can actually prove. And so they're calling that a religion. He can't help but he found what he knew would be there or believed would be there or what should be there. Um, but it says Arbit Armitage, a published scientist of over 30 years, was subsequently let go after CSUN abruptly claimed his appointment at the university of 38 months had been temporary and claimed a lack of funding for his position, according to attorneys. So, of course, that's what they're going to say. Yeah, we just couldn't fund him anymore. Now that he's discovering things, had this been the Piltdown Man hoax that he had made, he would have gotten hired, you know, or promoted. And so they are saying that it's because of funding, guys. Nothing shady here, okay? But uh, it says, terminating an employee because of their religious views is completely inappropriate and illegal, Deka said in a statement. But doing so in an attempt to silence scientific speech at a public university is even more alarming. This should be a wake-up call and a warning to the entire world of academia. And he seems so humble and laid back. When you watch him share his work and his findings, he puts out little videos. He's not going you know, and being just prideful, like, look at us, look at you dumb evolutionists that believe in this. He's very humble. He doesn't want it to become a debate. He wants the evidence to speak for himself. I've tried to have him come on to promote his work, but he doesn't want promotion. He just wants people to get hands on, experiment with it. He goes and brings these specimens to schools and lets them experiment with it as well. And so I'm going to show you the video of him going through and talking about this stuff. And there, there's a lot more videos. I don't want to uh, show everything he does. Just a little snippet of one of his. Let me see if I can find it. Rapid fossilization. There it is. Soft tissue. This is Mark Armitage. This is the guy I'm telling you about doing exactly what I was telling you. Let's see. Pull this up. It's Mark. I'm with the Dinosaur Soft Tissue Research Institute. We're a group of volunteer scientists who are studying dinosaur bones. Uh, and we're looking for soft tissue, for example, this Triceratops frill, which comes off the back of the head of the Triceratops, full of cells, full of veins, full of blood vessels, full of soft tissue. And so that's one of the three things I want you to know about dinosaur bones. We can dissolve these bones just like they're a regular bone uh, from any animal that's dissolved in the regular laboratory today. In fact, hospitals do this kind of work routinely on human bone specimens uh, that are collected by the doctors. And so we can dissolve these bones. These have not turned into rock. These are still bone. Uh, that's number one. 
Uh, number two, the fact that they're full of soft tissues means that they can't be old. We're told these are 68 million years old and, and older. And how can that be if they're full of soft tissue? And we know the soft tissue doesn't last for a long time. And so these things cannot be as old as we're being told because they are full of soft tissues. Uh, another thing that's very important to understand about these bones is that they're being found all over the world. Uh, every single continent so far has yielded soft bone that can be dissolved with soft tissue in it from dinosaurs. So those are some very important facts that you need to realize. But here's the shocking thing. We thin sectioned these bones. Here's an example of a vertebra from a triceratops that we thin sectioned and put on a slide. And we examined this under a very specialized microscope. And you know what we found? These are full of blood clots. All the bones we found uh, dinosaur bones now from six or seven different individuals. Every single one of them has blood clots in it. Here is one of those thin sections of Triceratops bone under the microscope. You can see the two white arrows pointing to very thick blood clots that are in the blood canals of the bone. The entire bone is filled up with these blood clots in the canals. Now if we look at it under UV, it looks completely different. The UV light is so bright and strong that it makes the metal inside of the blood clot glow. So what you're seeing is the glowing of the iron from inside the blood clot proving that these are indeed blood clots in these bones. Why is that important? What does it mean? Well, when a vertebrate organism dies uh, in water as a result of drowning, their blood clots inside their bones. It also clots in the rest of their body but the rest of their body rots away, right? But the bones remain, and so we found clots inside of every one of these bones. What does that mean? All the dinosaurs drowned. All the dinosaurs around the whole earth drowned because they all have clots in them. So this is significant. This means that they can't be millions of years old, and it also talks about a judgment. It reminds us of the flood of Noah's day. If these bones are full of blood clots, and all the dinosaurs have them, then all the dinosaurs died by asphyxiation in a flood. That means this world was judged, and there's going to be another judgment. All right. So that was a, just a, a quick view of some of the things that he's found. The soft tissue, again, there's videos of him manipulating this stuff under microscopes in the lab. And so he shares that. You can look at it. He's got tons of videos about it. And hardly any views or subscribers. I've shared his work many times on uh, different platforms. And it's just like he's very shadow banned and um, definitely doesn't want money. I've tried to find out if he needs funding and if we can support this guy. And uh, he's always like, no, don't do not do it. Everything we do is for free. It, and we do take donations. But um, he never gave me a way or a link. I'd like to give one and share. If, I, if he'd give me one, um, I'll see if I can find one on his website. But uh, again, I'm not saying that dinosaurs looked exactly like uh, the pictures and images we see. They don't have a full skeleton of them. A lot of the stuff is animations. These things were pre-flood Nephilim or creatures. You know, you find a giant femur, they can just tell you it was a long neck dinosaur. They don't have to say that was a Nephilim bone, a giant, you know, uh, roaming the earth. And the reason they are scattered everywhere and, and not in, intact is because of some clash of the Titans. They're not going to tell you that. They're going to say it was an asteroid, but this guy has proof that it was not an asteroid. It wasn't the sun being darkened by some massive cloud all around the entire ball. It was due to drowning. And so forensic evidence uh, supports that it was a drowning that took place, as well as the fact that these things are young. And so extremely hidden. And this has been out. This information has been out, I think, for over a decade. Let's see. Yeah, like a decade now, because we're now in this is back in 2013. And so it's 2023 now. So really cool work from this guy. You do not see this in textbooks. We still use the whole millions and billions of years. And the dinosaurs, when they look at the timeline, were always millions of years ago. So we have to share this stuff. Share this with teachers. Share it with educators. If you're an educator, share this with your students. Tell them this is new information. This is stuff that's only 10 years old. The textbooks haven't caught up to this stuff yet. And they're probably not going to catch up to it because we are still using things from over 100 years ago that were proven fraudulent as imagery in our text. And so we'll be going over that. I'm going to bring back up the uh, slides. And so we also have things like this, where you see, uh, you go to the bottom of the Red Sea. Some of you don't know what this is. 
if you've never looked into the proofs of the Red Sea crossing, we have um, Ron Wyatt who sent out a team and they, they found these things and other people have found these things, chariot wheels from the Red Sea crossing. And there's many of them down there. And they are, of course, this has coral, you know, growing all over. It's been there for thousands of years. But this is proof of the Red Sea crossing or almost proof. But when you look at the shoreline across from where this happened, where these chariot wheels are, you see melted sand. It's an entire shoreline covered with melted sand. You can even see there's a stone infused in this sand that, that melted. If you've ever been to one of those places where they make art with glass, it takes a few thousand degrees to melt sand. And so we wouldn't even have the technology to fake melting evenly a large area of sand like this. And I even look at it and start seeing like footprints. If you look to the uh, above the stone, it almost looks like there's a footprint right there facing us. And so uh, really just like a snapshot of how powerful that pillar of fire is. When you watch, if you ever watched the um, Exodus movie, the uh, movie from, golly, I forget what year it was from. Um, the original, the one that I, I watched growing up, the uh, Ten Commandments movie, they had that pillar of fire. And it was, of course, animated, but it was really high quality for its time period. This was before computer animations. And I always was impressed by that when I was a kid. Like, wow, look, there's these people running and there's that pillar of fire. And then you read about it in the Bible, but people went back and to this exact location, and this is what you find. Proof that the Bible is true. This book that they are banning, that they call a fairy tale that's just being banned everywhere because it's offensive and teaches love and forgiveness. Uh, there's proof to back that up. We don't have to have animations and add all this extra time to it. This is stuff that happened, and we are right at the door I believe of that millennial rain period. If you look at the the time scale, we've done videos on that and are going to do some more here soon. Um, but this is just a funny, a funny poster to have up on your wall <laughs> right here to change gears with some comedy. Um, it's, it's a whale trying to evolve into a land animal, you know, cause that's where wolves come from. They say, um, but it says, how are we ever going to evolve if you keep pushing us back into the ocean? Well, because of course, that's where you die. That's where they, they die. Every time you don't push a well back, they're going to die. They won't evolve into anything special. But uh, now I'm going to jump into the fraud. I, I hope uh, most of you, or I think most of you have probably seen these drawings. This was in my textbook when I was a kid. And it has to do with embryology, looking at embryos and how similar they are. And we have, again, it's a cartoon. They're not going to show real pictures in these textbooks. And they have a fish an amphibian, a reptile, a bird, and a human. And just look how similar they look in the early stages. Just, wow, we're so much like those other creatures that evolution could have happened, um, according to Ernst Haeckel, a uh, Nazi German scientist, who believed that it was the earlier life stages that changes happened to create different creatures. And so something happened in the womb, and instead of becoming fish, we started becoming humans, and that's why we look so similar. And... Uh, it also used to say that we had gills and stuff, but we don't. Humans don't have, ever have gills at any point in their development, ever. We never do. That was a lie. Some of you were probably told that like I was. We don't. We never have gills. Um, but you'll see words like this. It says, the fact that early development, they use the word fact quite a bit, of fish, birds, and humans is similar indicates that these animals share a common ancestor. Again, common ancestor, not creator. But they're saying the fact that they look similar. And here's more pictures. I'm, I've gone through. You can take these. These are in science books today. But here's the guy that made them. Ernst Haeckel, 1800s is when he was drawing these things up. Over 100 years ago, this guy was drawing this. Look at his drawing. Look how similar they look. More similar than the books. The books are kind of changing them a little bit. But when you investigate them and look at real photos, embryologists came along with actual photos and revealed, if you look at the bottom of the newspaper, the very bottom row, that's what they actually look like. That's how different they are. They are so much more, um, there's so much more um, characteristics that are not similar than those that are. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger. There you go. Um, so the embryos on the bottom, those are actual photos. And the ones on the row above it, at the exact same stage, this is what Ernst Heichel drew. He basically just hit copy and paste before it was cool and made all of his drawings and then took credit away from the creator in making life. 
And so he lied, and it's been proven a hoax. And it was proven a hoax decades ago, as soon as they started taking photos of these things. And so there you go. There's a bigger, bigger image right there. So you can see what they really look like. But th th again, a hoax from over 100 years ago, you'd think it would be long gone from our textbooks, yet it is still there today, influencing our kids. But this is where it gets dark. You know, we are calling this the darker side of evolution for a reason. And I will see if I can move myself back out of the way here. Um, you have this guy's images of what evolution looked like for man. And of course, he starts with the gorilla looking creature. You start with number 12 on the bottom right and on the, the ones that are black and white. The pictures on the left side of the screen, that's what I'm looking at. I wish I could use my cursor and show you what I'm pointing at. But the ones on the very bottom Number 12, it's numbered with a number 12. Um, they're all facing to the right. And you can see number 11 kind of looks like a Jewish person. Again, this was Nazi Germany. So, of course, the least developed human was a Jewish person. And then you go to number 10, starting to look more ape-like. Number 9, um, still kind of apish-like, but the mouth sticking out a little further. 8, 7, 6, they start trying to make it look like African-Americans. Like black people. Number five, that's pretty much um, a black person there. And then number four is like a Neanderthal. So the black people are before the Neanderthal, according to his drawings. And then number three kind of looks like a Hispanic person. Number two is your Asian person. And number one would be your super race, according to this guy. And they draw out on the right. He's got these little pygmies drawn out, these little people. And these are your missing links. He even has Loch Ness. I think he's the guy. But he drew that before Loch Ness was discovered. <laughs> I don't know why well, he's got Loch Ness over there. Maybe he knew he knew more than he was letting on. But um, he was a racist artist that was using art instead of actual science to express his views. His colleagues even talk about that, how it wasn't scientifically based. But he was a good artist, and he was sharing these things. And to become famous, that's what you do. You share your work. You get published, and it goes worldwide. And so they took those images out of our books, but the embryos, those are good. They're not as racist. But this stuff lit, led to a lot of things that we, we see back in um, Germany. But even worse, this stuff made its way to uh, America. And you have an incident in the Bronx Zoo where they used those drawings and those ideas of evolution to allow them to take a young child from his family and bring him to America, to the Bronx Zoo, and put him on display. And this is a sad, tragic story. This kid, Otabanga, his teeth were sharpened, and that's what made him, them think, oh, wow, this will be a really good uh, kid to put on display. Um, his family, they sharpened their teeth. You know, they did all these tribal things, and um, they found them living in a remote place, I believe, in Africa. And so they took this guy away from his family, and put him on display with a monkey. Thousands upon thousands of people came to see this boy. And that's heartbreaking. He later grew up and had depression issues, obviously, thinking, you know, them treating him like a missing link, putting him in a zoo, and then going, okay, this is wrong. We'll let you go back and into civilization and just see what happens. He ended up and he ended up uh, killing himself. Extremely sad story, heartbreaking. And uh Otabanga. You can look that up. It's true. The Bronx Zoo is still there. Cancel culture didn't get after that. Nor did they ever take the work of the guy that drew that out of your textbooks. Your kids are seeing work in textbooks that this guy produced, not this guy here, that uh, Ernst Heichel produced. And um, it's stuff that cr would continuously lead to that. If, if um, Christians, Christians, the ones that are being banned and silenced, didn't step up and say something about this. This is obviously a young child, not a missing link. The only difference is his teeth were filed down. And so Heichel was the guy that did that. There's how you spell his name, H-A-E-C-K-E-L, um, Ernst Heichel. And he claimed, and this is another one of his beliefs, that spontaneous generation must be true. Not because it had been proven in the laboratory, but because otherwise it would be necessary to believe in a creator. So this guy here, he was smart enough to know spontaneous generation would have to be true. Otherwise, there's no way we could get to the amount of life forms we have now. So even though he was re uh, racist, he knew enough to know that evolution was impossible. And so he was pushing that idea 
But around that time, you have Louis Pasteur, and this guy is debunking that myth that maggots just spontaneously appear when there's dead meat. That's what a lot of people thought. I would think that, you know, something dies with it. You walk away and you come back, and then there's like flies, larvae, being let, and there's all this stuff going on so quickly. Um, after something dies, especially out in the wild, you would think that it is spontaneous. But he has he was the one that helped uh, the pasteurization process come into being. Uh, Louis Pasteur. It's what's called pasteurization. And so he actually took a jar, if you're not familiar with that story, of um, meat that was rotting, left it open, and maggots and flies appeared. Had one of them with a cork on it, nothing happened to it, and then one with a mesh net over top of it, and that's, of course, where the maggots appeared. You can see how it worked out with the, anim with the uh, drawings here. But that was good old Louis Pasteur, proving that the thing that Ernst Haeckel said had to be possible or true, was impossible. And then one of the evidence that we have right here, and this one just cracks me up for a common ancestor, is that we all have a similar design. Or not all of us, but a lot of life has a similar design. And so tell your children, if you're a teacher of this, that a lot of people think that it's common ancestry, but common creator cannot be ruled out either. This is something that if you had a creator making life and it's the same creator, he's not going to change the way he's creating. He's not going to go, well, hands are working great. Let me go ahead and just use something totally different. He knows what works. He knows what's going to help that bat fly. He knows what's going to help that person use their hands to grip things, to work, to make things, to do things that no other organism can do. They're going to have to have these types of hands. And so birds are going to have a certain type of bone that's going to be wrapped and not just skin, like the, the person, it's going to have feathers that grow. Scales don't turn into feathers. Feathers don't turn into scales, like they say. Um, but if an evolutionist were to use those ideas and find a bunch of cars laying around, you could say that they all share a common ancestor. But we know, because we know they're creators, they have more than one creator, and it's mankind. They have a common creator, which is mankind. And so making the tree of life for them doesn't make them... Um, spontaneously generated or whatever and then finding you know the evidence right here here it is this was the first car to venture out on the land up here on the top left and um, that was those early land cars they didn't have wheels they would later evolve later evolve those if we if we use that same that same logic and so um so definitely definitely um funny logic if you were to start using that with everything you could say that and you could make little Geological time scales of these early cars, and we know that rust takes a long time, so this the degree of rust means that this one's got to be millions of years old. Um, but yeah, definitely some tinkering and corrupting of all flesh, but not um, we don't have changes in kind. Never witnessed it in our lifetime, anything changing its kind. You know, species of their own can interbreed, and we can have all sorts of variety, but a dog will always be a dog. And here's another uh, term that we have to use in class, analogous structures. These are structures that are different in their design, but they have the same function. So like a bat wing and a bird wing and a penguin wing. You know, the bat and the bird is going to be flying. The penguin wing, it's going to be used for swimming and the moth wing also for flying. And so they're different in their design, but they have the similar function. Okay, very similar. I guess all these are, I don't I think all those are for flight. I thought I saw a penguin. But um, so that's analogous structures. And they say that means we have a common ancestor. So they use these words. It's big words. It's intimidating. And you see those words and you think, wow, somebody's figured that out. They have a big word for it. They must be smart. So it has to be true. There's some more homologous structures. Um, natural selection, survival of the fittest. This is a big one. This will actually this is actually something that does happen. The strongest usually survive. Not always. Sometimes you just are blessed to survive. Um, in your situation, the father helps you. He parts waters for people. Um, they weren't necessarily the strongest. The Egyptians could have been stronger. The father set them free. Okay, so survival of the fittest, that's one that they push all the time. And they use things like antibiotic resistance because those reproduce really fast. But have we ever seen a bacteria, even as fast as they reproduce, change into anything other than what it already was? No, they're just better versions of themselves. They're the survivors. That is not proof of a change in kind whatsoever. So natural selection, not a creator. 
There's somewhere they got it wrong. I have to show this. I'm taking a lot of this from my notes in school. Um, but this is where you have fun. When you start looking at the evidence, when you really get deep into the evidence, I encourage you guys to look at the evidence. And that's what we're going to do because they tell us that horses evolved from this creature called the Eohippus. And we have all these things. But then you look at the one that was in between the Mary Chippus or whatever you call it and the Pliohippus. I'm forgetting their names because it's been a while since I've done this study. They say, oh, well, the Pliohippus, the one that was right next to the horse, even though there should have been tens of thousands of generations of these things or more before we got to the modern day horse, their skull, it had uh, too deep of facial. Let me, let me make my screen bigger so I can read this. Um, the skull had deep facial fossae, a feature not found in, in any members of Equus. Additionally, its teeth were strongly curved, unlike the very straight teeth of modern horses. Consequently, it is unlikely to be the ancestor of the modern horse. And so you can rule that one out. And uh, then we start looking. Here's the Eohippus, this little guy. They've, they've, they've <laughs> propped him up to look like a horse. So he's jumping over a log like back then. He was just instinctively doing his little log jump. Um, but there he is. And it looks cool. Looks legit. But you look at the size of this thing. This thing was about knee high to a person. Okay. Much smaller than your average horse. And when you look at the fossils, this is where it gets comical. And my kids can point this out. Your kids can see this. Look at all the fish. This is a land animal. What are the chances of this land animal that's going to become a horse dying in the midst of all these fish? Even in the water, I couldn't die around that many fish. Like, and this guy just, I don't know, maybe they like some fisherman was casting a net and they found him and then boom. Oh, look, we caught, we caught this little horse-like creature. Uh, let's toss him out with the fish and not eat the fish, just let him die. Um, a flood could have caused something like this, but uh, even the flood with all that water, it would still be hard to get that many fish. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine fish, I'm counting, uh, around this little guy. That's not where it gets weird. It gets even weirder uh, when you look at what this skeleton reminds me of, and it reminds me of size-wise and shape-wise of a capybara. Have you ever seen those things? A capybara is essentially a giant, like the largest rodent we have. And its habitat is near bodies of water. And if you look at their skeleton, their skeletons look almost identical. And they would be around fish, these little guys. And so I compile a bunch of them and you look at them. And you start noticing three of these, they all died in the exact same pose. So what are the chances that three out of four all died in the exact same pose? Two of the, two of the four we're surrounded by fish. So these guys love fish. Maybe they just like, they like coexisted with fish. I don't know. Um, and then you got the one in the top center. Let's see if I can find a bigger picture of him because this guy's cool. Let me see. Let me find him. There he is on the right. He actually caught a fish. <laughs> like, he's like, Mom, look, I caught a fish. And then he died. <laughs> he's like, he was showing it off and he's like, oh, sudden death. Didn't get to eat it. The fish got, and the fish didn't lose all of its flesh when it was fossilized. He did. So it caught that fish. It was happy. I don't know. Maybe the fish was trying to save him. Like, hey, buddy, you're you're going to drown. You keep Your other buddies keep dying with the exact same pose with fish. You should learn a lesson and uh, not be swimming with the fishes because you're a land animal, you idiot. And so he um, met the same fate, dying with a lot of fish. So this was Eohippus, one of the first missing links of the horse, they say. Yet yeah, all of their specimens are fraudulent. How, are they, how do I know they're fraudulent? Because look at them. They died with the exact same pose. All they do is change the the outside of them to make it look different. They could have at least not went so crazy with the fish. I don't know who the artist was. They hired that day was like, add some fish, and they'll believe it. You know, they'll believe it died <laughs> back in the um, prehistoric times because that's all that existed back then was fish and then this little horse guy. And so their um, even their toes look that does not look anything like a horse hoof. It looks more exactly like the capybara feet so that's what this would probably be if this was a real creature but they had to make fake fossil replicas showing us that it probably wasn't real or they just took one of those old um, skeletons from the capybara and just modified it like they did the piltdown man and said this was the ancestor let's break some of the ribs make it look old and so 
just bogus, bogus stuff. And they add that long timeline to it to make it seem more realistic. And it just falls apart. And here's one. I thought this was funny. This woman, I don't know if she bought into it, but she has one of these things wearing a, a horse saddle. <laughs> so it's kind of, kind of comical wearing the little horse saddle, the little, um, capybara. I wonder if those things make good pets. I have no clue. Someone said, Kent Hoving does a good teaching on this. I want to show you, I got to actually have a, a video on him. And I want to show you that. Let me see if I can pull that up. Um, where it also looks at the timeline of earth. This guy, um, he's, he believes in the globe. That's okay. Um, but he has uh, some really good evolutionary uh, debunks out there that he does. And one of them has to do with the time scale because they don't just have fossils. They have these ice cores, these long ice cores that they say prove the earth is at least hundreds of thousands of years. They can't do millions because there's not enough rings. Um, but they say it's at least hundreds of thousands. So I'm going to show that video. If you haven't seen that yet, uh, this is really cool. This is Kent Hoven. And uh, again, I don't, I don't agree with a lot of his tactics, but he's got some really good um, videos out there and things that break stuff down. So here's here's Mr. Kent Hoven breaking down that timeline uh, based on those ice cores and how that falls apart as well and actually matches the timeline that we know is real. One time and some guys came and they said, Hoven, we know you teach the earth is only 6,000 years old. Uh, we'd like to prove to you you're wrong. Would you come with us, please? I said, sure. They took me to this big freezer in Denver, outside of Denver in Lakewood. It's the National Ice Core Laboratory. 36 below zero in there. They put this big suit on me, big hat, big gloves, big boots. I was freezing in five seconds when I walked in there. I got Florida blood, you know, it's real thin. They said, Hoven, we go to Greenland and we drill holes through the ice. You know, government job. And we take this big pipe, we drill it down in, and we bring this ice core out of the middle of the pipe, and we save it in this big freezer here in Lakewood, Colorado. We have 10 ice cores stored in this freezer. They said, they, should, they took me over and showed me one of the ice cores. They said, you see these rings on here? It looks like tree rings, dark light, dark light. I said, oh yeah, it's real clear. They said, well, what happens in the summer, the snow melts a little bit. And then it refreezes and makes clear ice. It shows up dark on the picture. In the winter, the snow just packs. It doesn't get a chance to melt. And so it shows up as a white layer. So these layers represent summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. They said, now the deepest hole we've ever drilled is 10,000 feet deep. And we counted these ice rings, and there were 135,000 of them. And now you're going around telling everybody the earth is 6,000 years old. We can prove it's at least 135,000. I said, fellas, aren't you assuming those are annual rings? See, they didn't know about the lost squadron, apparently. But in World War II, some airplanes ran out of gas and landed in Greenland. Has anybody ever heard of the lost squadron? Okay, it's been on TV a bunch of times. Well, the airplanes got left there in 1942. They went on and fought the war. Everybody forgot about them until a rich millionaire from Kentucky got a brilliant idea. Go find those airplanes and bring them home. He went there looking for the airplanes. They had to use ground-penetrating radar to penetrate the ice, and they located the planes. They melted a hole to get down to a P-38. It was 263 feet below the surface. They melted this hole down to get to the plane, took the plane apart, and brought the pieces back up through the hole and put it back together in Middleborough, Kentucky. Not too far from here. How far is Middleborough from Knoxville? Uh, two hours, maybe? Okay. The planes, that's where its home base is, Middleborough. Well, the planes were in the ice for 48 years. They were 263 feet down. That's uh, five and a half feet a year. Now, the deepest hole they've ever drilled is 10,000 feet. You divide that by five and a half, you get 1,800 years. I know deeper layers get squished called glacial fern, so really 4,000 years is plenty of time to put all the ice at the North and South Pole. So why isn't there more ice at the North and South Pole? Mm -hmm. I visited the museum and saw the guy who dug out the airplane. His name is Bob Carden. I said, Bob, <clears throat> when you went down to get to that airplane, did you, melt through, did you go through ice rings? He said, oh yeah, many hundreds of them. I said, now wait a minute. How can there be hundreds of ice rings in 48 years? Shouldn't there be somewhere around 48? He said, who told you those are annual layers? 
He said, that doesn't represent summer, winter, summer, winter. It represents warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. You can get five of those in one week in Knoxville, can't you? Yeah. But here's a guy still calling them annual layers. Now, either he's ignorant or he's lying. I hope he's just ignorant, because ignorance can be fixed. You see, stupid is forever, but ignorance can be fixed. That's the difference, by the way. Uh, Okay, so that was a really cool proof that these ice core methods are false, and you can easily prove that by, thankfully, miraculously, digging up old artifacts that we have dated to modern times. And so that was Kent Hovind breaking that down and showing us that <clears throat> that narrative of hundreds of thousands of years just falls apart. And before, when I was looking at the things like that, the proofs of the ice rings and the ice cores, I'd say, well, you know, in Genesis, it just says the world was without form. It was void. And so it was already here. It was just void of life. And so it was just ancient. And this stuff has been here forever. And so you start making excuses for the creation truth because you see a lot of this evidence. And you're overwhelmed with it. It seems like there's just so much evidence for the um, old ancient earth, hundreds of thousands of years, um, at least, even if it's not millions, hundreds of thousands because of the ice cores. But as you can see with uh, Kent Hovind's example, the ice cores prove that they, they haven't been there that long. You know, it's the hot cold changes and not yearly like a tree ring. They try to use that tree ring analogy where it's every year, but not the case. All right, let's see. Yeah, I had somebody, some funny comments. Uh, I was trying to, <laughs> I put one up there. What was it? I can't find it now. Uh, GR Cleave said, yeah, my, my freezer is about 100 years old. Yeah, it seems like mine is too. You always have those deep freezers that have like thick layers of ice and like to take those off and see the ice rings in those and date those and see how old, kind of tell how old your food is when you go through those different layers. All right, let's see. I'm going to add my slides back. Um, but going back into the proofs, I know, when I was in about fifth grade, I saw a timeline like this or an evolution timeline like this where they show you these fish and they showed me the coelacanth. And we talked for, you know, like a long time about the coelacanth and they had images of its fins almost becoming like feet and letting it walk on land eventually as it evolved. And uh, that was really cool to me. I remember thinking about that and going, wow, I can see how that's possible. You know, if over time it tries if it tries to, you know, when you're a little kid, you think like, okay, if this fish tries to crawl on land, it's going to give birth to young that'll be better at it when that's not how things work. I could try to climb mountains and my child's not going to be born better at climbing mountains or have special hooks for fingers so that it can climb. Um, everything's guided by that breath of life, by your genetics, by your the code that was put into us by a programmer who programmed life, who created us. And so that was one that really stuck out to me as a kid and influenced my mind a little bit and brainwashed me. And I would see images like this. Here he is trying to swim on, trying to not swim on land, but crawl on land. We know what happens to the fish when they do that. They die. But according to the images, they eventually turn into lizards. And uh, the coelacanth, however, was found even back in the 1930s. I didn't know that. I thought it was extinct um, way back when. But they had specimens and even today, these massive fish still exist and their fins do not help them crawl. All they do is help them swim, but they were designed to have fins like they do massive fins because they are massive fish. They are not <clears throat> evolving into a land animal. It would not benefit them to try and be on land. Their best chance of survival is in the water. And then the, um, this is a proof right here. This is it's the Ostega. And the, and the reason I'm covering this particular specimen is because a, a, another teacher gave me a book called, I think it was Evolutionism or Evolution versus Creationism. And I think that was the name of the book, something like that. But it had a picture of a monkey on the front of the cover, you know. And um, of course, I'm thinking, oh, what is this? You know, what's this book about? And you open it and you start reading, and it talks about how these theories that, you know, creationists have have been totally destroyed. And we have evidence of a missing link. And even though that evidence didn't work out and we found out that it was fake, they found more. And so the newest one that they had was It's the Ostega. And I said, OK, well, let me they gave me this book and they're trying to educate me. Let me look into it and see what this creature 
actually is. And because this was one of the missing links, there should be a lot of them. If they were going to change, there would have to be uh, millions of them before they changed, or if not billions of them before they changed. But they have this specimen here, and it, they made it look like there was a lot of different specimens. But thinking back to when we were looking at Eohippus, that little horse missing link, you see the exact same fraud. You see the same tactics deployed. They make it look like they found a bunch of different ones, but they are all the same. This one here, they went through a lot of work. They sprinkled some straw around their artistic creation, and they made this thing strike its little atlas pose when it died. And all of them were in that exact same pose in different types of rock. And they try to get rid of the symmetry that we have with creation. They made the finger bones look different. Nothing's really symmetrical. The ribs just look like... Um, like I made some science project or tried to replicate something when I was in fifth grade or sixth grade, you know, making a, if I was to make my own fossil model. And so they all died striking the exact same pose, just like that little horse creature. And so sadly, I mean, you can see right here, look, I mean, all of them exactly the same. Zero percent chance of that happening to where the only ones we have look like that. They're trying to amplify their evidence by making more fake evidence. And this is all they have. This is what they have to go to. This is what they sent me. And my students can look at this and go, um, that's that's ridiculous. Uh, they're smart. Teenagers are smart. They're far smarter than we give them credit. And so encourage them to prove all things. If they're If someone's giving them evidence, tell them to look at it. Show them this stuff. And I know everyone doesn't have the time to go through and, and de debunk all of the evidence. And so we have to work together to do this. I've been, it's been on my heart to create a uh, creation curriculum website where we can upload a lot of these things, a lot of lessons that have how these, uh, this evidence falls apart. And, and, you know, I can focus on the science aspect and then I could get um, people like my brother and my wife who are math teachers that can actually go and use math to prove the truth about creation. Use math, like with those ice rings, like you saw Kent Hovind do, um, the curvature of the world, you know, all of the different things that they tell us should be there. We could use math and science to destroy it, um, but we don't, we don't see that. We see children just scrambling to learn all of these things, um, algebra, trigonometry, and all that, instead of applying um, math to things they can prove. It's just a bunch of problems to solve and Teachers work really hard to meet these standards. The students work really hard. It's a lot to cover. It's always really rapid. And then you move on. You get new kids. I feel like it needs to be a little bit slower. I would like for the pace to slow down so we could all investigate this stuff on a deeper level. <clears throat> and so that is, that's where, where I'm at with all this stuff. I really want to start focusing on this stuff more full time in terms of uh, destroying the evidence that they have for evolution and making curriculum that matches. Here is um, some more pictures I have. I actually put these in the presentations I show where they're showing us this creature walking on land in the animations that we see, but all they have is a head of this creature. An animator is the one that drew in the little uh, flippers where he's starting to waddle onto land and um, get to more of the uh, more recent land animals. And so they have this little skull here. Could be a real skull which to me, I've got an alligator skull below it, so you can see how similar they are. It looks like an alligator skull to me, or something very similar, a species of alligator. And uh, that would be their proof of the link after HDO stega. And so all I do is just go through and look at the evidence. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what the standards say to do. And when you do, it falls apart big time. And I'm not even going to spend a lot of I'm not going to spend any time on here going over the hoaxes um, that you see here. There's there these things can speak for themselves. Uh, you can look into them. The Nebraska man, the Piltdown man, and these are things that fooled the wisest people of their time. I think the Piltdown man was 40 years in a museum before they found out it was essentially a Hollywood prop. Um, so lots of hoaxes. I had planned on getting into those, but I don't want to. Um, cover so much in this one video it's a lot of evidence to take over um, but there's a lot of fraud especially things like the dino bird you guys have heard of that the science department was going nuts when this stuff comes out they're like look look at this here's here's what they predicted they predicted dinosaurs becoming birds and 
you know, the T-Rex turning into a chicken. And here we have um, proof, you know, and Nat Geo puts this stuff out. You think it's real. But they come back later after we find out it's false and they don't advertise the falsity. They don't advertise, hey, this was a hoax. And here's the here's the people that proved it. That, or here's the guy that was responsible for the fraud. We're sorry. They'll put out a little statement somewhere and nobody ever sees it. And the pictures remain. But that RKO Raptor, the dino bird, was a hoax. It's a known hoax. You can look into it. It's a scientific name that they already had given it. it was RKO Raptor. Lianogensis, or yeah, trying to mix the word Genesis there with that. But um, again, another missing link turned out to be bogus. If there were in reality all of these missing links and we all had a common ancestor, we would be walking on mountains of bones from all of these missing links. We wouldn't need to fake any of it. And so it's a lot like the uh, space travel. They wouldn't need to fake any of it. They wouldn't need to fake going to the moon. We would have a camera facing us from the moon 24 seven. We would have so many different things. And obviously the amount of um, bones again would be a mountain we'd be walking on from all the missing links to give us a new species, uh, more than one new species every year. And if you count in the mass extinctions and all of that, it would be like 76 a year. I think when I did the math with most of the life on earth arising after the 65 million year period, and so it's we would be studying evolution with time lapse photography. We would be having this conversation and I would be changing into something else. And so we don't see that. We never see a change in kind. This stuff is falling apart and it's it's easy to see um, easy. It's one of those things that's easy to wake up from. But it shows us how good the enemy is at lying. And uh, you guys need to really work to pray for your science teachers to wake up if you're in education show them these things, be bold about it. Uh, I'm getting at the point where I feel like we need to take more risk and be more vocal because sitting back and just going, well, it's no big deal. You know, just let them be responsible for their deception and be punished. I feel like I'm, I'm really feeling like I've, I'm going to be responsible if I don't speak to these people because they are speaking to children and I should at least tell them, give them a warning and show them the evidence. And so we all need to do that. It's not easy to do. I'm very non-confrontational. I hate drama. And so I'm, don't be mean about it. Be kind and try to plant seeds. But if people ask you, you know, why are you a creationist? Show them. Show them the evidence. We need to be very well versed in this stuff and um, point out the lies to people. Expose them because it is, it, it's a battlefield out there. And it's just been really hard. And that's why I wanted to do this video so I can kind of vent to you guys and show you what we see because it's been tough. It's been really tough um, going out there every day. And now that I'm in classrooms with other people, I'm seeing what they say and I can't change what they say. They're going to say it. I can just add my two cents. And so um, different role this year. I'm hoping to switch back next year to where I can be in my own classroom, influencing the kids directly, getting them excited about biology because it is an exciting subject. Studying life, the complexity of life is fun. And it, it, you, you can never figure it out. We can never figure out life, can't make it, can't replicate it. And so showing that to children, sharing that excitement gets them um, into the environment where they're wanting to learn. And so definitely, yeah, somebody said in the trenches. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It feels like um, you're in the trenches of a, of a warfare when you start seeing what's going on. And it goes beyond evolution. All the other classes, they, they're now starting to put earth science and space classes into the curriculum where kids are learning about space and the big bang and um, evolution and they go hand in hand and they get excited about these. And these are good people. A lot of these teachers that I work with are, are allegedly Christians. They believe in a creator. And so it's hard for me to understand how they would go and teach something that goes directly against them. Uh, but people, you know, they're like asleep, I guess in a deep sleep. So need to pray for them and uh, start uniting. And we need to have some more meetups. I know people have been, asking when are we going to have another gathering i want to have one soon i'm going to see if i can find my slide i think no that's not it oh, i didn't have it in this presentation um we're going to be traveling the country if i can find it um or remove this from my slide we're going to be traveling the country this summer i'll probably just do another video about that all together and uh, i want to have meetups along the way when we stop so that i could see you guys and um 
you can reach out to me with your emails if you're in any of those places. Again, I'll do this video, that video separate and uh, make it about that. I'll be going live tomorrow from another channel. Uh, Matthew Beavers, Back to the Covenant. He's been on our, ours quite a bit. I'll be on there tomorrow around 5 o'clock, I think. I can't remember the exact time. I'll have to look. Uh, but I'll share it in a community post. We'll be live there. And again, this is our first time going live on YouTube and Facebook. And so I haven't, if I haven't seen your comments, I apologize. Uh, if you guys have any questions, though, before we go, I've only been going for an hour and 25 minutes. Um, good to see Dennis and Debbie in the house. Two of my favorite truth seekers out there. We do Bible studies with them all the time. They're full of wisdom. You guys are all full of wisdom. And I'm learning a lot from all of you. So thanks so much for your support and hearing us out, looking at this evidence with us, going through deep dive into evolution or evil evolution, some people call it, because it is extremely evil. It is a direct attack against the creator. It takes that away from him. It says we have no creator except for time. Time passing by created what we have now. Sounds ridiculous, but that's the, the common belief of most of probably, I'd say, I don't know what percentage. I like to see a, a chart of how many people actually believe that, but the numbers are growing um, thanks to the education system. Again, no, no, no hating on educators. Educators work hard to um, give the kids a good environment. And, you know, like me, when I first started my teaching in the science classroom, golly, back in 2008, um, yeah, that was 2009. It was second semester um, when I got thrown into the science classroom. I was teaching with a globe in my hands, showing the Coriolis effect because that was the unit they were on. And it was wisdom to me. I thought it was wisdom. I was proud to be teaching and proud to be showing these kids how things worked. And the irony is that the father woke me up to the truth about the world and just, you know, showing me that mercy and that compassion that like, even though you were doing this, I was waiting on you to wake up. You're, you're my child. I love you. And uh, the love of the creator is what woke me up. I would not have woke up to the truth about creation had he not healed me for one like he did. I've never really sh shared my full testimony on that. I plan on it really soon. But um, he healed me. And that was back in 2007 when he did that. And so he healed me or no, actually, I'm sorry, it's 2008 and no, 2007. I take that back. Yeah, 2007. It's been a while um, since he did that first real powerful miracle where he healed me. And then I had a bunch more happen about six or seven years ago that woke me up completely because I had to ask the father to show me the truth after that about creation. And he did. And that brought me into all this stuff about evolution and the shape of the world and how foolish the wisdom of this world really is to our Father, and why the, the Bible asks us or tells us we need to find people that are wise in this world and let them become fools, because the wisdom of this world is foolishness to our Father. So if you're thinking about becoming a fool, stop thinking about it, take the deep dive, and um, see what it's all about. Talk to the Creator, get, get to know Him personally. And you'll find out that he's done some major things for us to not only set us free so many different times, you know, Noah's Ark, the uh, Ark that Moses was placed in so he could lead the people out of Egypt, little baby Ark, <laughs> um, the Ark connections we have there, the Ark of the Covenant. And then, you know, eventually we're looking forward now to the voice of the Archangel when the, the uh, father and his beloved son are going to return. And uh, that millennial reign is very soon. So thank you guys for joining us. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and sign out of here. I just I feel like I miss you guys so much. It's been so long since I've talked to you. I don't want to go. Um, but I want to come on here more. My wife is actually wanting to come on and talk about things, talk about prophecy. Uh, we're going to be looking at the 10-week prophecy in the book of Enoch probably and see how it compares to the biblical timeline with every thousand-year period being like a day. And we're right next to that seventh day. And if you know about creation, that seventh day was spectacular. It was a day of rest. And so we're about to enter that day of rest, that millennial reign period, I believe. And so we'll look at that, go through all these things. It's going to be um, a lot of fun, a learning adventure, trying to learn all things and prove all things. It's quite fun. So uh, look forward to that. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We're getting about one comment per day on YouTube now due to censorship. And so uh, those of you who are sharing, we appreciate it. 
It really helps us out. Those of you who are supporting us, it's a big blessing. We were just now able to get air conditioning into the office. So this summer, it's going to be wide open. I don't have to worry about burning up and uh, sweating in here. I can actually do videos in comfort. we got a small little split unit. And so things cost money. I'm hoping or feeling led to sort of step back from the teaching role that I'm doing in the next couple of years or so. I don't know. Maybe that's um, not the father's plan, but that's what I'm feeling led to do and focus on creating creation curriculum and ministry stuff, learning the word, sharing the word, spreading the good news, maybe going on the road, uh, doing things and just no longer wasting time. We're running out of time to uh, spread these things. You guys can tell it's about to get real. There's talks of a mothership UFO. I don't know if you've seen that in the news, the UFO stuff still going in action. And so um, really cool to see the things we've been warning people about happen. And uh, let me see if I can, somebody, somebody gave a super chat. I wanted to say thanks, Michael Hart, for uh, your super chat. That's a major blessing uh, for you guys supporting us. Again, humbling. And I just ask that the Father keeps us humble along the way as we have grown. And um, he has. He hasn't let it get to our heads. He hasn't let this channel, um, our ministry, become an idol. And I'm fortunate for that. I don't ever want it to be that way. If it ever seems like it's being that way, I don't want a part of it. Um, so definitely blessed to uh, have all you guys here in fellowship with us, little soldiers, family that we have that we're going to be spending an eternity with. So love you guys. The Father loves you. I'm going to go ahead and sign out because I'm not seeing any questions, but it's good to see your presence here. I know you guys are doing good. You all are, as always, beloved creations of the Most High, and we'll see you around very soon, hopefully tomorrow if you join us on Matt's channel. But uh, take care, stay safe, and stay ready.